very familiar portion to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. We shall read all together verses 7 and 8 together. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Shall we pray? Our gracious, loving, heavenly Father, we thank thee and we praise thee, Lord, for giving us another opportunity to be found in thy presence, Father, Lord. Morning till now, we thank thee, Lord, for being in our midst, Lord. At this very time, end of this service, Lord, as we have come to the, for thy guidance, for thy uh, mercy, Father Lord, be thou merciful unto us, speak to us from thy throne. Thy word may be released from thy throne. Thou knowest I'm an unworthy vessel. There's nothing good in me. I'm not worthy to stand here or before thy children. But Lord, I hide, Lord, I beseech thee that I might, thou may hide me behind thy cross. And Lord, thy word alone may be uttered out of this mouth. And thy name alone may be glorified. We give thee all glory and honor. And as the humble praying, I'll exalt the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. So during this week, Aaron and I, we never spoke about the message. So, <laughs> But every time when I give a message, someone already gives the message about it. So, um, so we did not discuss about the message. But anyway, uh, that's how Holy Spirit works, I guess. So. As we were walking this morning also, like we were coming in the car, we were, I was talking to my mom, then we were talking about the Ark of the Covenant. So why God created the Ark of Covenant? Because God wanted to come and dwell among us, you know, where he wants to come in. And we were talking about it, and then we were talking about why Adam created a calf. You know, we were just going back about why, about the idols and all this thing. And then we walk in, and Aaron gives the same word. And uh, then, and after that, this message is also is going to be part of what Aaron has brought this morning. So um, it might be the same, it might be a little different, but may the Lord help us and that maybe his name may be glorified. Um, 2 Timothy verse, uh, chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. This is a very well-known portion. And every Christian in every believer's life, this is an important thing that has to play a role in their life. Because this is the main purpose a believer can enter into the kingdom of God. A believer can enter, uh, 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 can, can receive the crown of righteousness. So Paul, if you look, go back to the life of Paul, we all knew, we all know how Paul, how Paul was transformed. Um, I believe in um, Acts, Acts 3, I believe, Acts 3, we read about, sorry, Acts, Acts 9, sorry, Acts 8, Acts 8, we read about Saul, Acts 8, chapter, um, Acts chapter 8, verse 3, as of Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hailing men and women, committed them to prison, so this was the Saul's nature, this was the uh, uh, Saul's position. This is what he was doing. He was watching Stephen being stoned. But then God has transformed this treacherous man into a vessel of God's ministry. That we see in 1 Timothy. Um, Paul uh, is actually giving a testimony about himself. 1 Timothy chapter Chapter 1, chapter 1, and we'll read from verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me for that. He counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I ignorantly in unbelief. So this is the transformation of Saul who became a Paul. So God chose this treacherous man who was, trying, who was actually trying to break the church. 
try to break the, uh, the uh, uh, to to uh, to destroy the children of God. But here then we see a complete different story that happens in Timothy, how Paul is testifying himself that God brought him into the ministry for a purpose. So Paul is one of a very important character in every Christian's life. How Paul led his life and what we can learn from Paul. So this is what Paul is saying in the second Timothy verse what we just read. I fought a good fight. Paul did not have a life of bed of roses. He was persecuted. He was prisoned. He was mocked. So the Christian's life is a race. Every believer starts the race when we get transformed into the love of Lord Jesus Christ. We, everyone, start a race. As uh, Paul says here, the same thing. I have fought a good fight. He, never, he didn't say, I won the race, but I fought a good fight. So every Christian, every believer has a fight that he needs to fight. It might be his infirmities. It might be, uh, it, it might be anything. But our life, if we are into, many might drive, many may run into the race. As we know, many are, can run the race, but they all run for one price. But every runner's uh, goal is that price. But in a Christian life, we all run a race. But our goal is finishing the race. It's not where you started the race, how you run the race and how you finish the race. That's what Paul is saying here. I have finished my course. What is our course? What is our goal today? Is the price our goal or the kingdom of God is our goal? Christ Jesus is our goal. That's what Paul is saying. Jesus Christ was his only goal. Though he went through so many persecutions in his life, when he was transformed into Paul, when he was entered into the ministry of God, he said, I fought my fight. Every individual, every children of God has a fight that they have to fight. They cannot hide from the fight. If you are hiding from your fight, if you, wanted to, uh, if, if you do not want to have that fight in your physical life, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. That's what Paul is saying. Many may run the race, but some may lack. Some may fall back. Some may get scattered because they get too much occupied, carried away with the world. The things of this world may come and, and separate them from the love of God, from the goal that the God has set before them. The cross, Lord Jesus Christ is the, is the example that was set before us. But Satan tried to rob us from that race. This is what our every day to day uh, fight is with our own self. Satan uses our own mortal body to, to, to stop us to attaining to our goal. So if you see in Paul, uh, in Philippines chapter 3, verse 4, Philippines chapter 3, verse 4, Paul is giving an example of why he was called into the ministry. What is the purpose of his calling? Uh, Philippines chapter 3, verse 4. Though I might, uh, sorry, uh, verse 3, verse 14, uh, 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What is our calling today? What are we marching today? What is our goal? Is this, the, is this the high calling of God that we are marching for? Or we are marching, running the race because just, just because we are all are in the race, we don't, we, don't, we don't have any goals, what our race is going to get us to? Or we are just going with the flow. Those are the children of God. Those are the believers who get lost. Those are the ones who get robbed away who cannot finish the goal that is set before them. That's what Paul wants us to be reminding us on and, and uh, uh, reminding us about the race, how he has fought that race. In 2 Timothy 4, 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. Can we, or today, you and I, can we say that? 
Lord, I fought my fight and I will finish my course. Do we have that assurance? Like Paul, can we say that? But if you also look at Paul in 2nd uh, in 2nd Corinthians chapter 12, we often this is our this is our problem. This is what our excuse is as well. Uh, 2nd Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. Um, lest I, and lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Here Paul is talking about a thorn in his flesh. What thorn is he talking about? It could be any thorn. We do not know. But God left a thorn in his flesh. And then he says in verse 8, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice. If, if Paul was not worried about this thorn, if this thorn was not bothering Paul, why would Paul beseech the Lord for three times? And then did the Lord ignore him? Here you see in verse 8 he says, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And verse 9 he says, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, my strength is made perfect in weakness. This is the strength of Paul. This is, should be the strength of every believer in our life. It's not the thorn that is bothering us. Yes, every, every individual has a thorn in their life. It may be the infirmities that they're going through. Maybe a physical problem they may be going through. Maybe the, the mockery in the life they're going through. Maybe the losses in the life they're going through. We may often think God has forgotten me. Maybe we often think that God, I've been pleading with thee, but you have left me alone. Yes, Paul thought the same way too. That's why Paul also pleading with God thrice. Lord, can you remove this thorn? Because this thorn is slowing me down. This thorn is, is keeping me away. Can you remove this thorn? But the Lord here in number verse 9 is beautifully says, my grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon us. So this is what, this is an exact example that Paul is giving to us. That we may glorify in our infirmities. Because this thorn that has left in you and me is to bring us closer to the Lord. To bring us to know how strong God is in our life. This is to, to let us know that his glory may be glorified in us. That's the reason the Lord left the throne. The throne is not going to eat you or me. It's not going to destroy you and me. It's going to bring us closer to the Lord. That is it's going to make us to, to, to run the race steadily. Focusing on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the thorn that Paul is, even though he was beseeching to remove it, but he, here in verse 10, he says, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. This is, this is the secret of a Christian life. This is the secret of the, the life of a God's children. There is no one without, no one is perfect. No one has, the, uh, uh, has everything in their life that they wanted. If we have everything in our life that we wanted, we don't need God. So that's why many of them were scared to run the race. Many of them stay away from the run. They all start together with a with with great passion. But as they go through, as they run the race, everybody falls back because they cannot keep up with the thorn. They cannot keep up with the fight. This is what they, I, our life has become. Our Christian life. That's what Paul is clearly saying. I fought a good fight. And he expects each and every one of us to be strong and fight the good fight. So that the grace of God and the strength of God may be exalted and manifested in you and me. For that, everyone has to live with that infirmity. Whatever the infirmity may be. Whatever the loss may be, whatever the, the problems may be, everyone has his own thorn. But the, that thorn is not going to devour you. That thorn is not going to destroy you. But of course, if you allow it, yes, it will. That's what happens to the, 
uh, happens to the people who fall back. But if we allow God, Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ as our only goal, then as Paul says, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. So Paul needed to be weak to felt strong. So we have to be beaten down to be strong. That's what we read also about gold and silver. Gold and silver has to be tried with fire. Unless it has been tried with fire, the, the, the glory of the gold and silver cannot be, uh, if you read, I think it's in uh, 1 Peter 1.7. And also Matthew, uh, Proverbs 13, I believe. 1 Peter, if anybody has it. Well, So it has to be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory unto the appearing of Jesus Christ. And also we read also in uh, uh, Proverbs 13, um, and anyone can help me, Proverbs 13, I'm not sure the verse, 13, 17, 13, 13, um, how gold has been tried. But anyway, uh, I can't remember that now. Anyway, 13th, oh, hold on a second. Uh, uh, 17.3, I think. Yeah, Proverbs 17.3. The refining fire of silver and the furnace of gold, but the Lord tests the heart. So the Lord tests us our heart, right? So how, do, how we are refining the gold and the silver? It has been tried with fire. It has been beaten. It has been, it has been melted to remove the impurities of our, from the gold and silver. Then it becomes a precious ornament. So that's what here we read in our, uh, first, second Timothy. We come back to Paul where he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept my faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous just uh, shall give me at that day and not to me only but unto all them that love his appearing who loves his appearing the gold that silver with full of dirt appears is appearing no because it becomes worthless so you are tried with fire you are tried with all this infirmity so that you may be appear as gold and silver ready for the king ready for the throne this is the fight Paul is talking about that he fought a good fight. How, is, how, how are we fighting today? Are we, are we still running the race or we stopped somewhere in the race? This is where it is. It's not about getting into the race, finishing the race. <coughs> and if you see in he, uh, secondly, excuse me. secondly, a believer's race First we saw how we, fought, how we need to fight to be in the race. Secondly, we turn to Hebrews chapter 12. <coughs> and verse 1 and 2. If anyone can help me. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God secondly here we see the race that endures forever right An enduring race first we saw of a, a, a race with struggle. Now we have to endure the race. Who's the example here that was given to endure our race? Lord Jesus Christ himself has been given as an example for us to endure, endure our race until the end. That's what he says. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. What are these weights in our life that is stopping us to endure our race? Is the infirmities that we spoke, we, we just saw earlier, that's stopping us? Or is our time has been robbed for the other things of this world that has kept us away from enduring the race? It may be anything. It may be any idols in our life that could keep us away 
That's what here it says. Let us lay aside every weight. It could be any weight that could stop us running the race. We don't run the race with all the weights in us. We will never reach. So if we need to attain the goal. Here that's what here says. That we may, that let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Every sin in our life, in our life can stop us. Every sin, known sin, unsown sin can play a role to stop us. That is the goal of the Satan. He does not want us to finish the cross line. Because crossing the line is where the eternal glory is. That's where the crown is there for us. But first, here he says that, that we may set a lay aside every weight. In Colossians, in, uh, in Colossians chapter 3, It's the, excuse me, in Colossians chapter 3 and verse uh, 1. If you, if then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Verse 2. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Uh, go on, uh, verse 3 as well, sorry. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when, Christ, when verse 4, when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then ye shall appear with him in glory. So this is what the weight that we are talking about. What he here he says, uh, where is our affection? Set our affection on things above, not on the things of the earth. That is where our weight comes. Because if our affection is, is everything that is around us, or if our affection is of the world, if our affections is of the material things of this world, that becomes a burden. Because we are more where our heart, where our, uh, our, our treasures are, that's where our heart will be. Right? If our, if our affection is on the earth, we don't want it to look up to our, the goal. Because we are busy, occupied with the things of this world. That's what here he said, let us lay aside every weight. If we are going to carry everything with you, we will never finish the course. And it will be too late. Too late to, cover, to, uh, to question ourselves. Why we are not able to com complete the race. Because we had so much baggage with us. We had so much of love of this world. Our eyes was not. Here it says that our affection on things above. Not on the things of the earth. That's what. That's what Paul was also saying in that. Where is, how are we going to finish the course of our race? If our eyes are wandering all around, the path is not clear for us. Because we are too much, we are occupied about the things that, uh, that, uh, that, that may not of the things that glorify God's name. It glorifies us, glorifies the person next to us, glorifies the things of this world, but not the glorifying God. If we are, if our eyes are set on glorifying God, all these material things disappear from our sight. Our goal is set straight. That's what here we read in Colossians chapter 3. Thing. <coughs> and now if we go back to Hebrews chapter 3. And verse 12. Hebrews chapter 3 verse, verse 12. Take heed brethren lest there be in you any of you, an evil art of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily what, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Verse 14, for we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. So here, this is another warning. Here we read, what it says here, for we are, the, for we are made partakers of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. When we, what we started our race, if we hold back, if you hold to that, that is what he is saying, because we are made a partakers of Christ. But then verse, uh, verse, four, verse 13 says, uh, sorry, verse 12, Take brethren, lest there be any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. These things, can rob us away from entering into the kingdom of God. These things can rob us away from getting the, 
the, the crown that is laid for you and for me. Not only for Paul, for everyone. Thirdly, talks about a Christian life. How about we, uh, uh, we talked about uh, in, the, in the worship message, we were reminded about it as well. About a fruitful believer. So these are the part of the race of every believer's life. How is our race? How fruitful is our race? If you turn with me to Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, here we talks about a tree. It's a very familiar portion. Everybody knows from Sunday school. Matthew, uh, Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, verse 3. and uh, Sorry, chapter 11, verse 12. He was hungry. Yeah, keep going, sorry. And seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. In response, Jesus said to it, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard Thank him. you. So here we see about the fig tree. But again, uh, in verse 13, it clearly says, And seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if happily, uh, he might find anything thereon. But this is, this is not really talking about the fig tree. It's talking about you and me. It's talking about the believer. It's talking about a child of God. How are we? Are we like this fig tree? Green outside, but no fruits inside. Jesus coming to the tree with so much of happiness, seeing the godliness of you, your outside appearance. And when he comes to know you, you are a barren. There is nothing in you. But that's what God is clearly saying. He's cursing the tree. If you and I become barren, he's saying he's cursing that tree. He will curse you and me. It's a very strict warning. He's a gracious God. But if you and I not able to bring that fruit, you are cursed. That's what we read in Ma uh, uh, Ma Matthew's, uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 10. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 10. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That's it. It's cut down and thrown into fire. So this is, this is the one that he's talking about. How many of us are living a life of a fig, this fig tree? We look godly outside. God is also watching us about the hypocrisy in believer's life. If you see in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 23, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 23, talks about the Pharisees. 23 and verse, 23 and verse 25. O oh, unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye make clean the outside of the cup and the platter, but within they are full of exhaustions and excess. Thou blind Pharisees, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. O oh, unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like unto of whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men born. And all of uncleanness. What a sad thing it is in a Christian's life. This is what we read about this fig tree. We may look so godly outside. We may fool others. We cannot fool God. This is why God say, if that is our life, if it is, if it is our life in that way, we will not reach our course. We will not cross that finish line. We will be cut off. We will be cut off from the from the congregation. We'll be cut off from the, the uh, from the uh, children of God. Certain people are cut off in, in, for, from, for a certain reason in our life. It's because God knows that are barren. They remove certain things from our life. Because God knows these are barren and he does not want them to influence you and me. So this is what God was saying. Here is, this, this, is, this may not be a season for the fig tree to bear fruits. But God's point is not the tree. God's point is you and me, that we may look godly outside, but if we do not bring fruits for the Lord, we are nothing and we will be cut off. It's a very, very, very uh, straightforward, he's saying that. And also, if you see in the same words, we talk about the temple of God. God in the Old Testament talks about he wanted the temple where he can come and dwell among us. He wanted to dwell among us. 
but if the god is not in the temple it is just the four walls has no meaning there is no use this is what we read in um, about eli's children ofni and phinehas what happened to them ikabod when the when the ark of the god was taken the, dip, the the glory of god was departed i believe it's in first samuel chapter 4 first samuel chapter 4 think four i think four uh, uh was 17 yeah let's was 17 also the messenger answered and said the israel is fled before the philistines and there has been also a great slaughter among the people and thy two sons also hophni and phinehas are dead, dead yeah. and the ark of the god is taken ark of the god is taken the ark the god departed from israel because of hophni and phinehas because of the children of god the god's dwelling place can be taken away this is what he's talking about in the same thing in mark's gospel chapter 11 we read about the temple when god goes into the temple when he sees all those all those dirty things so he sees all those businesses he sees all those things that is verse 17 um, mark's gospel chapter 11 verse um verse 17 and he taught and saying unto them it is my house shall be called for of all nation the house of prayer but you have made it a den of thieves this is what happened in israel phinehas and hophni this is what they did they they were priest they were the, uh, they they are the only one who can enter into the holy temple holy places they himself sinned because of their sin god departed from israel what a great loss it is and we also see in the same thing happened saul was anointed king and we read in the same first samuel chapters 11 12 or something out there for saul was anointed king but saul did not wait for samuel why because of his impatience because he took hands in his own hands things in his own hands because god no god is the one who anointed him but he because of his self pride because of his own uh, 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 the, uh, he, he because he disobeyed god he did not he did not wait god actually testing saul here why did god delay samuel god there was a reason for god to delay samuel to test saul what this saul is going to do here but saul took matters in his own hands and then we know what happened the throne was taken from Saul it was given to someone man after his own heart god may take in your crown today he may take my crown today if we do not if we do not endure unto the end your throne and my throne and your crown my crown will be taken from us given to someone this is what paul is saying here in the in, in uh, first timothy chapter 4 verse 7 uh, i have fought of good faith but i kept the faith how is your faith and my faith today and also we see in john's gospel chapter 5 15 we have we read this morning chapter 15 and verse 2 john's gospel chapter 15 verse 2 Every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away every branch that beareth fruit he purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit and verse 4 abide in me and i in you as branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in vine no more can he except he abide in me if we do not abide in the lord we cannot bring fruit because we cannot ourselves bring the fruit out God is the only one who can bring that fruit. How do we bring that fruit? John's Gospel chapter 15 clearly says, if you abide in me, he is our temple. He is our he is of the head of the temp, the church. And if I, we are the branches, if this branch does not abide with the tree, abide with the head of the temple, it cannot bring forth fruit. It will become like the tree with just bare leaves that has no fruit in it. and if we do not abide in him that clearly says here and also verse here in in my father glorify that he bear much fruit so shall he be my disciples 
So this is what by every believer have to we understand that that our ultimate goal is to bring fruit. Our ultimate goal is to reach that trace. Our ultimate goal is to aim for that crown. And our ultimate goal is that God may be glorified in you and in me. Yes, the race that we are running will have many, may have many obstacles, many barriers. But we have to run the race, not looking outside, not looking at the things around us, but looking only at the cross. I remember a story which I heard of many, uh, but I, I really like this story, but I heard in, from one of the uh, social media, I don't remember where. It talks about um, a, a small cave when there's like about uh, hundreds of frogs get trapped in a cave. And they have to climb up the cave to get to the water. Or they have to climb up to get to the outside to be free. So in this hundred, uh, hundreds of uh, frogs that's inside that cave started talking to each other. Okay, we need to get up there, but we cannot go up there because on the halfway, there is a snake waiting to eat us. There's another frog is saying, yeah, once you cross the snake, there is humans over there. They're going to catch us. So this was the thing. So what happens is the fro other frogs, what they did is, they started fighting each other. He said, okay, I'm not going to listen to your stories. I'm going to climb up and go to the other shore. So the frog climbs. It goes one side. There is no snake. Then he goes to the next. Then he thinks, hears. People are saying something down here. Oh, you can't pass the snake. There's someone waiting for you to kill you. The frog gets scared, jumps back in. So this is what going on happening to every other frog. But suddenly one frog was going, going, keep going. It crossed the snake. It crossed the human. It crossed the thing and got into the water, become free. So all of the frogs here are saying that how come this frog climbed all the way, went, when no one else can do it? The other frog was saying that frog is deaf. It could not hear what they were all saying. All his goal was only to get outside that cave. All his goal was only to get into that water. All his goal is to become free. But if the frog was not deaf, that frog would have been trapped in the same cave. So this is exactly what is, uh, our Christian life is. There may be mockery. There may be persecutions. There may be, uh, uh, people might put you to shame. But if you listen to all that, we will never cross that line. Crossing the line is more important in our Christian life. It's not where you start, how you end our life. How you end your life. That's what Paul is saying. It's, it's not, uh, it, 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 that's why this is a very, uh, th there's so many meanings to this one verse. That how Paul kept the faith. How Paul ran the race. And how Paul is, uh, how Paul has, uh, he said that he has finished his course. Can you and I can say that yes, can we finish that course? Do we have that assurance that we will finish that course? If we need that assurance to finish that course, today the Lord is talking to us. Like Zacchaeus, as we are reminded. Zacchaeus was, was sitting on the tree, sycamore tree. When God called him, he came down right away, that same day. He did not wait for anything else. He did not think who he was. I was touched by that. We heard that story many times. But that incident, that Zacchaeus never thought about anything. He came down the immediately when God called him. Jesus called him. How are we today? When God is calling us to run the race of a Christian believer, are we ready to run the race today? Or are we waiting for a better time? Waiting for all our, all our uh, commitments to be met. Then in my free time, then I will start the, uh, my Christian life. Then I'll start living for the Lord. No. Salvation is for today. Redemption is today. And work of God that needs is today. You and I, are we ready to work, do that? So finally, go to 1 Corinthians <coughs> chapter 3. And God is also is saying that chapter 3 verse 16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. 
If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So this is the question that God wants to ask. Yes, we talk about God dwelling among us. We, talk, we, we want God to be in our midst. But God is saying, this four walls is not the temple. You are the temple of God. How is your action? That's what here in Corinthians chapter 3 verse 16 says. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. We are not looking at the four walls. We are looking at you and me. He dwelleth in, it, in us. Are we prepared for it? Are we able to have the Lord dwell in us? That's what he says. If any man defile the temple of God, any man defile your own self, because you don't belong to yourself. You are Lord's. If you defile yourself, you're accountable to God. That's what here it says. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which is temple ye are. So may the Lord speak to us and help us to understand this, that we may be holy before him. And that as the Lord has once again, he has said, fear not. Yes, we do have infirmities. We do have problems. We do have Obstacles in life, fear not, I have overcome the world. He said, that's as Paul said that he, you know, as we read again in Paul said that he has made uh, strong in our weaknesses. So the, may the Lord help us. And once again, I want to read this verse again. Uh, for First Timothy chapter 6, verse 7, chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me. A crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, not to me only, but unto them also that love is appearing. So let us focus on the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us run the race continuously. Let us endure unto the end. And let us, let, let us long for the appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us be ready for the appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ. In that way, we may cross that line. In that way, the crown that is laid for you and for me will be given unto, unto us. And let, let us not allow anyone else to take that crown that is meant for you. Everyone has a crown. We are not running to take someone's crown. We are running for our own crown. But don't let your crown be taken and given to someone else. As Saul did. So may the Lord help us. And prepare us as the world is, as he's coming soon. As we hear rumors everywhere, war, rumors of war, nation against nation, famines, people are dying. Lord's coming is very near. So our race, we make sure we don't get distracted from our race. As with all the noises that's around us, our goal may set forward on the cross of Calvary and let us run the race before we know the Lord is going to be here and then it will not be too late for us.